Just to uh, let you know, we're uh, now going to do a uh, cross-examination period. And according to schedule, we'll, I will be asking first this time around. Uh, then we'll have three-minute closing statements when we're uh, done with that, and that'll end the, uh, the second round. Are you ready, sir? Yeah. Mrs. Jenis, uh, is it your assert assertion that Honorius uh, is to be excused this error as far as a papal error because he was not, in point, in point of fact, speaking ex cathedra? Yes. On the issue of the two wills, yes. Okay. Uh, could you please list for us, sir, uh, all the teachings that Honorius taught ex cathedra using the exact formula uh, that you have indicated he would have to have followed uh, to teach something ex cathedra? I don't have to produce that because it's not necessary to show that he wasn't speaking ex cathedra when he gave the statement on the two wills. That's Are you aware of any ex cathedra teachings by Honorius at all? Uh, no, I'm not. Okay. Um, has the Roman Catholic magisterium ever infallibly proclaimed that Honorius was not speaking ex cathedra in this instance by name? Not by name, no. Okay. Uh, has it ever proclaimed, well, you said you weren't aware of any ex cathedra teaching, so there wouldn't be any reason to ask that. Now, if Honorius did not teach anything ex cathedra, that is, as the pastor of all Christians, did he fail in his duty as a shepherd of the flock? Was there no pressing matter upon which he needed to teach in his day? He failed on this issue of the two wills. That's very obvious. And if he could fail on that issue, he could fail on some other issues. Uh, there are no issues that we know of that he failed in, but it's a theoretical possibility. Did the popes who reigned after Honorius but before the Council of Constantinople uh, correct Honorius' error? Yes, they did. Uh, and how did they do that? Well, he stated that Christ had two wills. Uh, did they say that Honorius was in error prior to the council saying so? Yes. And you would say that Agatha's letter did that? Yes. Okay. And the sixth council did that. All right. As the seventh and the eighth council did. Is there, in light of your assertion that uh, Honorius, uh, his statements do not violate the doctrine of papal infallibility, does it follow them? Well, but let me change that. Is there a list of infallible pronouncements from the popes that you could provide to us so that we could go to a book and, and read? No, there's not a list. Uh, the, the church could do that if it wanted to. Um, the church could do a lot of things that it, if it wanted to. For example, the church could um, determine every single variant of uh, the biblical record. There's you know 5,000 Greek manuscripts, and many of them say different things, as you well know. Uh, on some occasions, the church has said that one variant should be in the scripture, uh, but it hasn't made a judgment on uh, most of the variants in scripture, but it could theoretically do that. And it could also give us a list of uh, all the uh, ex cathedra statements that popes have made. Uh, it could list all the errors some popes have made in encyclicals or letters, but it, it hasn't seen fit to do that. On some occasions, when the issue uh, confronts the church on what is right or wrong, the church will go back and investigate when she has to and make a decision. And uh, implicitly, she did this with Honorius because everybody knows that Honorius sticks out like a sore thumb. So when the church makes her criterion for papal infallibility, she's going to take into account what Honorius did without actually mentioning him by name, which she did do. And is, Honorius' name was passed around during the council. If a person's very relationship with God through the gospel is uh, affected by ex cathedra infallible teachings, uh, wouldn't it make sense for the Catholic Church to tell us what is an infallible teaching and what is not? Well, it has. It's given you the criterion, and Pope Agatho's condemnation of Honorius and, and the uh, affirmation of the Sixth Council's uh, decree against Honorius uh, is one of those instances where the Church tells you that this is what it says. It is, it is dogmatically decreeing that Honorius made an error. So to answer your question, they have done that. Are there not Roman Catholic scholars and apologists who would disagree with you on the number and scope of infallible teachings by the Pope? There, there may be, but I'm sure there's a lot of Protestants who disagree with you about your doctrines on uh, many issues. That's true, and I don't claim to be infallible. So if there is infallible, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to throw that in there, but uh, if there is this uh, issue. But we don't either. We don't claim to be infallible uh, either. That's the issue. <laughs> if there is anything in, if these issues of infallibility are so important to defining the gospel, and there is no list of infallible teachings, then isn't it 
being left up to individuals to apply some set of criteria and come to their own conclusions as to what is and what is not in fact? No, because there, there is a partial list, and when issues come up that people need to know about, the church will investigate them. That's, for example, why uh, it, it took 1,800 years plus to determine the doc doctrine of the Immaculate Conception or the doctrine of the Assumption. Uh, it took 1,600 years plus to form the infallible dogma of the canon of Scripture. Um, there's all kinds of things that take time. The church addresses them when she can. Isn't it possible uh, that further uh, conditions beyond the five that you've listed could be added by the church in future years upon, shall we call, further reflection on tradition, which would uh, even further limit the allegedly infallible pronouncements of popes, ones that you'd accept as infallible today, would be defined as not being infallible uh, with the further addition of further... Um, uh, criteria? No. As a matter of fact, that's the issue at stake here, is when the dogma is defined, and that's the key word, that's the operative word here, is defined. That means that nothing can be added to that definition. That is the dogmatic definition that will stand the history of time for now until all eternity comes. So what we have to understand is that up until that point that that definition is made, things can be added, things can be changed. Things can be discussed, and they discussed this right up until Vatican I in 1870. But once that definition is made, it is solid and it will never change or be added to, just like Scripture will never be added to. So when, uh, when Honorius spoke, is it your belief that the definition that you use today was understood by he and others around him? Well, implicitly, the church says that that was the definition they were working with. And they say that because the Sixth Council knew that Honorius had made an error in his teaching. And yet they said, this same Sixth Council said that Pope Agatha was infallible in declaring Honorius a heretic. So the Sixth Council understood what the definition of infallibility was. They knew it was not uh, going to be uh, applied to Honorius because Honorius didn't bind the church. He didn't fulfill all the criteria. But Agatho did. He bound the church. He spoke from his Petrine office. He went back to tradition. He uh, got the synod together, which is another thing that Honorius didn't do. He didn't have any synod backing him up. There was all kinds of things that Agatho did that Honorius didn't do, and that's why the church can make their definition of, definition of infallibility the way she did. And where was that uh, definition of infallibility infallibly defined by a pope or by a council uh, prior to the days of Honorius? It wasn't. It doesn't have to be. Okay. Now, so Honorius was personally a heretic? Personally a heretic? What do you mean by personally? Did he teach monothelitism? Uh, he taught that Christ had one will. So is that a heretical view? That's a heretical view. So the Pope can be heretical, but it is your position that by some means he will be prevented from teaching officially his heresy? Right. So uh, are all the Popes actually uh, believers? Are all the popes? I don't know. Some could, some couldn't be. I don't know. So I'm it's not. possible for the vicar of Christ to be an unbeliever? Possible, yeah. So that's an interesting view. Now, in regards to Honorius' uh, condemnation by the Sixth Ecumenical Council, they did say, did they not, that Honorius taught the church this? Honorius taught the church this? Taught uh, monothelitism. They said he wrote a letter to Sergius that Christ had one will, and that uh, doctrine of one will was held by other people like uh, Cyrus and Pyrrhus and a few other people that they condemned with Honorius. Whether they said it was a teaching for the whole church or not, no, they didn't say that. Did they not say, quote, that uh, Satan had, quote, actively employed them in raising up for the whole church the stumbling blocks of one will and one operation? Yeah, but it doesn't say that he taught the whole church. It says that he was raised up, and, and if he wasn't taken out of the way, he could have taught that error. Uh, but they don't use the word teach there. So uh, exactly how is it that uh, the phrase actively employed them in raising up for the whole church, what does that mean if it doesn't mean they taught individuals this belief? Because he didn't bind anybody to his teaching. So because he didn't use a specific term saying you are to be bound by this, uh, then uh, a person who read Honorius's letter in that day uh, would notice the lack of these words and therefore go, oh, this is, a, this, is, this is not really a binding teaching of the Bishop of Rome? That's what the Sixth Council said to us. I read that for you, and that's what Agatha said. That's what the Emperor said. That's what Leo II said. They said that Honorius did not have these criteria, and therefore they could condemn him. 
So Honorius could write that letter, and for 40 years, if, if you lived during uh, the period of time between Honorius's death and that, and you read Honorius's letter, by what means would you personally have to recognize that this was A, not binding, and B, it was heretical? Well, number one, um, uh, this is a very esoteric doctrine of the church, whether Christ has one will or two wills. So it's not really a matter for the populace to decide for themselves, number one. Number two, uh, a doctrine like this really has, if it's not binding upon them, has no bearing on their salvation, as I said before. So it's not that you know everybody's biting their nails wondering uh, when this doctrine is going to be clarified, because it really doesn't affect the church practically. There's many things that happen like that in the church where it takes time for the church to sort all these things out but the important thing that I think that you're missing is that they finally do have a time where they say this was wrong and we can live by that for the rest of the time, for the rest of the 2,000 years minus the 40 that it took them to get there. So that's the real issue at stake here. Well, but if you died in 660, what's happening today is not going to be overly relevant to you. So my, my question really is, again, uh, if you lived in that day, what mechanism do you offer to us? whereby an individual, upon encountering a papal encyclical teaching doctrine X, how can you determine whether that papal encyclical is A, meant to be a teaching of the Bishop of Rome, and B, whether it is in fact infallible? I wait for the church to make a decision. Until then, it's not binding on me, so it really doesn't affect me. It's not going to affect whether I go to heaven or hell, so it's really not an issue. So, you, so, so in other words, you don't have any mechanism to know that until and if the church makes a special pronouncement on that particular issue, you may never know well, if, whether it's binding or not. Me personally, I don't claim, and I don't think anybody in the seventh century claimed to have a mechanism to determine whether the church is true or false or not. That's the premise you're working with because that's your religion. Uh, in that day, no one was that audacious in the seventh century. They waited for the church to make those decisions, and that's really the whole debate tonight, is does the individual have that opportunity, and does he, is he supposed to do it, or is the church supposed to do it for him? Now, we believe that the church is the one that's supposed to do it for him. If it takes 40 years to do so, well, that's the way things go. Thank you. Hey, Dr. White, do you believe that Christ having one will is a heresy? Yes. Do you believe that Christ having two wills is orthodox? Yes. Could you show us in Scripture where you know that to be true? That comes from the fact that, uh, as the Council of Chalcedon itself taught, the Scriptures teach that Jesus Christ is both God and man, that he is one person with two distinct yet whole natures. And the Council of Chalcedon was perfectly biblical in teaching that because it recognized that the will arises uh, from those natures. And therefore, all the passages of Scripture that refer to, for example, the Lord Jesus in, the, in uh, Paul's writings, as they crucified the Lord of glory. Here is an indication of the fact that Christ is one person with two natures, uh, that the crucifixion is, is a part that was done to his physical nature, and yet he is called the Lord of glory in regards to his divinity. So I firmly believe the Chalcedonian definition is biblical in its foundation, and therefore monothelitism is an error because it, in essence, undercuts that and results in someone saying that Jesus' human nature uh, was not fully human. He was not truly a, a man, and he was not truly united with us, and therefore the entire concept of the atonement uh, is threatened, and that is, in point of fact, uh, what was uh, so troubling to many of those who encountered that particular belief in the days of uh, uh, Honorius and Sergius and, and thereafter. Okay, let me pursue this with you a little bit. Um, I couldn't help but notice that you referred, first of all, to the Council of Chalcedon, but you don't believe that they were infallible, do you? No, I certainly do not. I do not believe that any council is infallible. I believe that a council's authority is always subordinate to the sources from which they derive their beliefs. Okay, so then what the Council of Chalcedon said could be an error, is, is that yes, correct? Yes, it could be, unless okay. it is in line with Scripture. For example, the, seventh, or the second Nicene Council 
uh, which I believe is uh, numbered the seventh ecumenical, if I'm recalling correctly, uh, was very much in error in promoting the concept of uh, the adoration and veneration of images. And you can see this by examining their alleged biblical argumentation. In that case, their biblical argumentation on an exegetical level is, is, is utterly fallacious. Okay, so you really have no reason to refer to the Council of Chalcedon because you don't know that they were infallible. No, uh, I, that wouldn't be true, sir, because as a person who honors the fact that God has been building his church for 2,000 years, I am not one of those who believes you, you ignore uh, those who came before us. I honor the memory of those who came before me. I just simply do not invest them with the element of infallibility any more than I would look at uh, someone like a Calvin or a Warfield or someone else and say, well, unless I believe they're infallible, then I'm going to ignore everything that they had to say. Well, I'm not saying you have to ignore them, but uh, you, you said to me that you believed that two natures was orthodox, and, or I'm sorry, two wills with orth was orthodox, and one will was not orthodox. Right. Uh, you really have no way of knowing that from the Council of Chalcedon was my point. All you can do is reference them and say that uh, they believe this thing or that thing. Now, going on, uh, you refer to scriptures that talk about the two natures of Christ. Could you cite that scripture for me? Uh, that was uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 2, as I recall, off the top of my head, the passage that I was referring to. Uh, if they had uh, known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Uh, off the top of my head, as I recall, that was uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, yes, 1 Corinthians 2.8. The wisdom which none of the rulers of this age has understood, for if they had understood, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And in the work that I've done, the doctrine of the Trinity over the years, and dealing with oneness Pentecostals, uh, this passage and some others, for example, possibly Acts 20, 28, uh, have been some of the key passages that are used to uh, point out the fact that Christ is uh, one person, a unified person, that he's not two people like... Uh, many in the oneness movement present, uh, that has uh, two natures, hypostatic union, uh, all those other things that come along with that. I'm familiar with all those terminologies. Uh, what I would ask you to do is show us in 1 Corinthians 2 eight where it teaches that Christ has two natures. Well, again, uh, if you're asking for explicit creedal statements or if you're asking for the revelation of God in Scripture, and uh, any creedal statement's authority comes from the accuracy with which it reflects God's words. And so any creedal statement, whether it's an answer to a specific question that we derive and put into the form of the language of the question, its authority comes from how true it is to the scriptural passage. So I am not saying to you that 1 Corinthians 2.8 specifically addresses the issue of two natures. It teaches that they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And when we think about who Jesus Christ is in the context of Paul's teaching, we know that the Lord of glory is a, a reference to his deity, and yet crucifixion is something that one does to a man. And therefore, to distill that revelation into an answer to a question is what theology is all about. Okay, well, I submit that I don't see that teaching there. I think you're making an implication that it's there because of other ideas that you have. And if that's the strongest verse you have, I'm having difficulty in seeing how that supports two natures. But the issue here is actually not really two natures, but the two wills. As you know, in the uh, formula of the Sixth Council, it said that uh, two wills came from a source. Okay, so it's different than two natures. Uh, could you explain to us then, uh, because you said you believe that Christ had two wills, not one will, where the teaching of two wills is in Scripture as opposed to just two natures. Well, again, it is an implication that is drawn from biblical facts. The biblical facts are that to be a person requires a will. A human being who does not have a will is not a person. And so to say that Jesus Christ was uh, one person with two natures, and yet those natures are not full, would be to say that Jesus was, for example, a semi-God, but not truly God, or to say that he was semi-man, but not truly man. And this was the problem uh, that was seen in that day. And again, I uh, would not uh, invest any type of authority in a formulation outside of its faithfulness to its underlying biblical foundation. Okay, so I gather you don't have a scripture that points out that Christ had two wills. You are getting there by using your logic. And I would submit this to you, that uh, the Sibelians did the same thing. They used logic when they were trying to define the Trinity, and the modalists did the same thing too. They said, how can God 
be one and three at the same time. That's an impossibility. And yet the church held that even though it sounds impossible, it is indeed true. So what I'm asking you this, what I'm asking you is, uh, you seem to be using logic to arrive at your decision rather than using some scripture that tells you that Christ had two wills. Uh, do you find that contradictory? I read the Bible and I do not read it irrationally. Uh, I allow it to speak for itself. I allow it to speak as a whole. I believe that scripture is theonustos, which means that every word speaks with the authority of God. And that is why we can do systematic theology is because what Paul writes to Timothy and what Isaiah wrote in his revelation are not contradictory to one another. And so when you say that the Sabellians and the, and the modalists and uh, Arians and anybody else quote unquote used logic, uh, what you're seemingly saying is that we're not to use logic in listening to what scripture says. Uh, I believe that since God is the God of truth, you listen to all that he says and you do not interpret him in such ways to make him contradictory to himself. That is the glory and the wonder of scripture is that when you allow it to speak for itself, it does speak with one voice. And in responding to the Sibelians and the modalists, they did not use logic on every passage because they misinterpret passages in such a way as to make the authors contradictory to themselves. Uh, I find it interesting that you grilled me on the issue of the two wills and you said for 40 years no one knew whether that was true or not, so what's a person to do? And yet I'm asking you for one scripture that talks about two wills and you haven't given me one yet. And yet you claim that scripture is your final authority. You, you went to 2 Timothy 3.16 and you said it's uh, profitable for, it's theopneustos, it's, uh, it's the ultimate that you go to for any controversy at all. And yet you still haven't given me a scripture saying that Christ has two wills. You've given me a lot of verbiage uh, that says we should do this, we should do that, we must think this way, we must think that way. But the, the point, in fact, is, uh, I'm going to ask you again, uh, if someone's salvation depends on a doctrine of, of this sort, as you implied, uh, and he can't find it explicitly in Scripture, what is a person to do, Mr. White? Well, Mr. Sinus, you, you just made a number of statements uh, as a part of a very long question, and you said that I had grilled you for, for uh, quite some time on that period. You're the one making the assertion that there is an infallible authority that we must embrace in the Bishop of Rome. And it has been my assertion that that very assertion itself is ahistorical, and I believe many scholars agree with me on that point. And so it is not my assertion that uh, the situation with Honorius, historically in his own day, uh, demonstrated that Honorius was a rebel against what had come before. The problem is that it is your assertion that they believed in papal infallibility in that day, that they had these criteria, and the simple fact of the matter is they did not. And so if you're attempting to contrast the claim of Rome that the Bishop of Rome is an infallible authority when teaching ex cathedra with the clarity and the perspicuity of scripture in regards to many issues that the Bishop of Rome teaches on today, I personally don't see any parallel between the two at all. And I see nothing wrong in my challenging you to attempt to prove to us from history rather than just assuming it that these individuals believed these things and my saying that all those individuals in that day did believe that what we have in Holy Scripture today was God breathed and that it did contain the fullness of the gospel. Okay, uh, you said that I'm making the assertion. Uh, I did back it up for you because I, I went right to the writings of Agatho, Pope Leo II, the emperor of the period and the Sixth Council and they all said the same thing that the Pope Ag Agatho spoke infallibly on this issue and was against Honorius. Now, the question is for can you. I, is that a question? or do No, I, that's not I a question. It's not a question. This is the question. Uh, on the other hand, you said I was making an assertion. You were making the assertion that scripture gives you the answers for your faith. And I'm asking you again, show us a scripture that says that Christ has two wills. It's again, I have never made the assertion that the phrase Christ has two wills is in scripture. I have said that that is a logical and proper conclusion from the biblical evidence itself. And even more important than that is the fact that those individuals that you are citing, you, you quote Agatho, uh, here is someone who in his teaching never taught the things that you as a Roman Catholic today would teach as necessary to the gospel of Jesus Christ, such as the bodily assumption of Mary. And this is the, the entire point here is that what we're supposed to be discussing is did Honorius teach in such a way as to violate the doctrine of papal infallibility and how do we know? Uh, it is an interesting question to ask uh, whether we should uh, have a debate on the issue of the natures of Christ on the basis of biblical evidence, and I suppose we could have a debate to discuss that. I'm not sure anybody would show up for it, but I suppose we could do that, but I don't think that it's relevant to this particular issue at all.